Money is a tool, and being rich is not the same as being wealthy. So why do the wealthiest individuals out there use whole life insurance as one of their main tools? Well, we're gonna dive deep into that, but I gotta warn you first. This video isn't for everybody. Let me tell you who this video is not for. People that have a negative mindset. This is not for you. This video is not for people that don't understand the laws of wealth. This video is not for people that aren't willing to learn. This video, I'm sorry, it's not for broke people with broke attitudes. So for the rest of you, this video is gonna be pretty incredible because I'm gonna to talk to you about why the wealthiest families in history have used a product that a lot of you don't like and don't also know much about called whole life insurance. What families? Well, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Morgans, the Stanleys, the Ray Crocs of the world, the Walt Disney's of the world, the Warren Buffett's of today's time, and the current sitting president, just to name a few. If that's not enough, well, dive a little deeper and you'll find the list keeps going on. So we're gonna get into a vehicle that you've been told is a terrible place to put your money. However, I'm gonna quote Will Rogers on this one. The biggest problem in America is not what people don't know. The biggest problem is what you think you know that just ain't so. My name's Chris Noggle and this is What Now, What's Next? If you're one of the people that believe the Dave Ramseys and the Susie Ormans about whole life being one of the worst places you can put your money, well, congratulations, you're just like everybody else. And you're just like I was. You see, I was a financial advisor at a really high level for 16 years. And I was always taught, buy term, invest the difference. And it made sense. I could sell some life insurance, buy term, my clients had the lowest premium, and then I got to manage all of their money if I was good at actually taking over the assets, which is where I made most of my money. And it wasn't for much later in my career when I actually started getting around some really wealthy individuals that I started seeing some misguided truths about what I was taught. You see, the wealthy that I knew and the wealthy that I know today all play a different game. And the game is very different than what I was taught when I was an advisor. Now, if you think the wealthy are buying term and investing the difference, well, you've got a very small portion of that story correct because the wealthy have to put their money somewhere. And the wealthy don't typically like banks because banks don't pay them hardly anything. The banks also know how to make their money go to work for them and that wealthy individual knows that as well. So what the wealthiest individuals figured out is a better place to store their money. So let me talk to you about one particular client. I have lots of wealthy clients, but this one I really love. And it's not because he's got a lot of money, it's because of his attitude and what he does. He's a big real estate developer, has hundreds of development projects and all sorts of stuff, but let's get down to it. When we got talking to him, we, we were doing business with him on a different level with Private Money Club, but we, we really started talking about money and where all of his money sits. And I was actually surprised to hear that he had his money in various different places, but very traditional. A lot was kept in the banks because when he needed to borrow money, he would need to show all that money sitting in the bank. So I said, yeah, but what if there was a better place for you to store your money? And he, we got into the conversation. We talked about a lot of the, the fundamental reasons why this might be a better place. And I'm, I'm talking about specially designed and engineered whole life. Now, why would a wealthy individual be interested in whole life? Let, let's hit some of the basics. The number one, they want safety. If they're gonna invest money, they're gonna invest it in themselves, in their businesses, or very calculated through a whole team of people. A lot of these people that we're referring to work with family offices. And therefore, by nature, I've started working with these family offices. And I haven't found a family office out there that doesn't love what we do with the infinite banking concept and the specially designed and engineered whole lives. The other thing you're gonna have to get over when you work with wealthy individuals is their team. You're gonna to have to meet with their advisors. You're gonna to have to meet with their consultants. You're gonna probably have to meet with their CPAs as well as their attorneys. It's a long process, but it's okay because typically their team is very well aware of the things that that wealthy individual is seeking, like safety, security, definitely liquidity, especially if, you know, if we're talking about this client, he was seeking liquidity. Him and his wife are the operators of the business and they always need money for new development projects. And 
Well, taxes. So when we talk about this, the very first thing that they're usually interested in is the tax treatment. So we'll just call that the tax advantages. And let's talk about some of the tax advantages that come along with whole life insurance. Number one, if it's built properly, it is 100% tax free. So what do I mean by tax free? Because that's kind of a, a word we got to be careful with. Well, I mean that all the money that they put into the account and all the interest and dividends internally that the account grows at, if done properly, are all tax free. And when I say if done properly, I'm referring to the IRS rules called the MEX 7 pay rule. So we just have to build the policy within the, the guidelines. So most of the tax structures that they have set up involve trusts. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll have the trust become the owner of the policy and therefore we can even get a little bit more advantages when it comes to taxes, but we're not going to go there today. The second thing that they love is all the money grows tax deferred. So over the years, as this money keeps building, it's always building tax deferred. And the best part is there's limited restrictions. So what do I mean by limited restrictions is a lot of them can find tax free or a tax free environment through a Roth IRA. But most of these wealthy individuals, their income is far too high to qualify for a Roth because they hit the phase out limits. So this gives them all the advantages, a tax free environment, gives them tax deferral and all with limited restrictions on how much money they can put in. They can stuff as much money as they want in as long as they get qualified for it. So from a tax standpoint, they love this, but let's go a little deeper. There's some more things that wealthy individuals like, and, and this is where the average person may or may not understand what we're going to talk about. Liquidity. So when I say that word liquidity, what do you think about? You can go to your bank, take your hard earned money and deposit it. But then if you need that money back, I don't know, let's just say in the next 30 days, you can go back and you can take that money out. That's liquidity, right? Well, do you think wealthy people are, are concerned about that? Absolutely. They're finding opportunities all the time, especially this gentleman with real estate. There's an opportunity coming across his desk every single day. So liquidity is incredibly important. But here's the misconception. When you think of liquidity, you don't think of whole life insurance, do you? No, because you've seen whole life. Typically, when you put money in to premiums in a whole life, you have no money available year one, no money available year two, and no money available year three. But that would be if we're only talking about standard, regular whole life that's sold to you by, well, your brother-in-law or someone like that. We're talking about specially designed and engineered whole life, very much like a bank would operate. See, banks are the number one purchases of whole life. And if you haven't ever seen it, it's called Bully. B-O-L-I. And you guys can look up Bully on the FDIC.gov website or just Google Bully and you'll find out banks, even the top five banks own more than 75 billion. They use their tier one capital and they put it into whole life. But do you think banks are putting their tier one capital in the same whole life that your brother-in-law is trying to sell you? No. These policies are specially designed and engineered. They're specially designed and engineered to provide liquidity immediately. Matter of fact, Boldly policies, which we've been on the other side of, especially back when I was an advisor, I saw these, but I never understood how the average person could do this. A Boldly policy is designed to have almost all of the cash value available right away. Now, policies that you and I are gonna design might not be that rich, but I'll show you the numbers in a second. They're incredibly rich. So when we talk about individual plans, or when we talk about COLE plans, which just stands for company owned, so your business can own it, okay, the bank, the bank owns it, but we're not talking about bully today. We're really just going into individual uses. And company owned uses. So let's hit some of the, the main items. First off, liquidity. So the way we're gonna design these policies, we're gonna design them backwards, essentially. If you bought a regular whole life, you're buying it for a death benefit. I mean, come on. When you bought life insurance, what has the ad advisor or agent said? How much death benefit would you like? And you say, well, well, I don't know, I was thinking about a million bucks. And they say, okay, your premium is gonna be X. What if we started with, how much money do you want the ability to put into your specially designed whole life? See, we call these private banking policies. How much money do you want to put into your private bank is what we would typically say. And the client says, well, or this particular client, well, what about 
$2.6 million. Can I just put all that in up front? Yes. So what we're going to do is we're going to build the policy to hold the amount of money that they want to put in first. So for this client, the liquidity is $2.6 million. Now, do you think that this client wanted to lose liquidity on $2.6 million? Absolutely not. Matter of fact, this, this client wants to put the money in and then as soon as he's got a deal, he wants to take that money out. And then after that, one of his concerns was he still wanted to put money into the policy, but not to the tune of $2.6 million. Matter of fact, this client just had that money sitting aside for a deal that they were going to be closing on. So that was the 2.6. Every single year, this client came up with 300,000. They wanted to have the ability to put a max of $300,000 into the plan. So that's how we built it. We built the policy to hold $2.6 million. We call that a dump in and $300,000 a year in premium deposits. This is how we designed the policy. And in a second, I'll show you the liquidity because it's more than 90% right out of the hole. So in the first 30 days, this client did indeed take a loan from their policy and they took a loan for roughly about 90% of the money that they put in. Now it's not 100%. And it's not gonna be 100% in year one. It's probably not gonna be 100% in year two. But in the first couple of years, it's gonna be more than that. So I want, you to, I want you to see the numbers in just a second and understand that you're going to give to get. This client understood that. They didn't need 100% of the money. And unless you're one of those people that goes to the bank and goes in and makes your deposit in the bank, but before the end of the year, you go back to the bank and you say, yes, I'd like to take all of my money out of the bank just to say that you could. You see, most wealthy individuals have a little bit more money and they don't need to play that game. So if you're one of those that puts money in the bank and immediately takes it out, this isn't for you. So they're also focused very much on guarantees. It's the reason they keep money in banks. They don't want money in banks, but they need a guarantee on their money. Banks are paying them less than, right now, even ultra wealthy are getting less than 2% in most cases. Maybe the oddball is getting three, but it's not guaranteed. It's, it's a variable rate. Plus every single year, these mutually owned insurance companies that we use for these designs, they pay dividends. Matter of fact, the company that we put him with, with had paid dividends consecutively, never missing one, for over 160 straight years. So this is something that was incredibly, incredibly important to this client. They wanted a guarantee on their money that was more than what the bank was. Well, we came in with a guarantee that was almost three times what the bank was paying him. And not only that, with dividends, we came in where it was almost five times more than what the bank was paying him. The other thing that this client was very, very concerned with is they wanted not just liquidity, but they wanted the ability to still earn interest on their money even if they were using it. Now that doesn't even sound real, right? But it is. Because let me talk to you about one of the ways that we design these and the way that whole life works. Matter of fact, this is just about all whole lives. This client could not only put this amount of money in, but they could also take this money out. And now when we take it out, we're gonna take it as loan. So I'm just gonna call this loan features. So when you think of a loan, you think of a loan as a bad word. Oh, you gotta pay it back. But when you take a loan from a whole life insurance policy, especially the ones we design. That loan is the insurance company advancing you part of your death benefit. So in a second, we'll see what the death benefit is because the fourth thing we're going to talk about is going to be legacy, which is where the death benefit comes into. So legacy is the death benefit. Okay, we can all understand that. When you die, a death benefit's paid. But the insurance company also allows you to use your death benefit while you're living. So let's talk about that. Person puts 2.6 million in, and they're gonna take a loan immediately for that money. Is that, if they take, if they put 2.6 in, now let's just say he takes, they put 2.6 in, and I'm just gonna ask you guys, 2.6 million in, and then let's say they take 2 million out, how much is left? Most of you are thinking, well, 2.6 minus 2 million is 600,000, right? That's how much you think is left in the policy. Wrong. When you take a loan, you're taking your death benefit. So the death benefit, is what the insurance company is loaning you. The cash value, this 2.6 million, in this case of a $2 million loan, 2 million of the cash value is going to collateralize the loan the insurance company gave you. But here's the cool part. The loan does not interrupt the interest in dividends that you're earning. So in other words, if he took, if he started with 2.6 million, took out a loan for 2 million, you thought there was 600,000, but there's not. There's 2.6 million still earning interest 
in dividends. Okay? This would be called uninterrupted compound interest. And you know, as far as I know, there is no other guaranteed place where you can put your money where your money can actually earn uninterrupted compound interest while still using the money. This gives this developer the ability to make money twice, hypothetically. They can make the interest and dividends on the policy, but then they can put the money in their real estate deals and make money a second time. The only thing in the middle that they've got to do is they've got to pay interest on this loan. And this client, the interest was 6% on the loan. But their money was earning with interest and dividends 6%. So if we think about that, their gross return was 6% and they were paying 4% interest, hypothetically that would be a two point spread, which it's really not because you got to look at the internal rate of return, but still they're making a positive spread on their money. Now the other thing too that was very important to this client, he's got young children, he's got a beautiful wife, legacy. Someday if something happens, he, you know, has a car accident, plane crash, something, he wanted to make sure that his family was taken care of, that all of this stuff that he's built in his business doesn't just go away. Now we already had $40 million, I think that's right, 30 or $40 million in term insurance. But the term insurance all expires in anywhere between 20 and 30 years. This policy, although not set up for death benefit, provided him, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe about 40 million, we'll look at the policy in a second, but it provided him a big death benefit that would last for the rest of his life. But that wasn't the intent. The main intention here were these things. I want liquidity of my money. I want a guaranteed interest rate on it and the dividends are pretty good. I want to be able to use that money anytime I want immediately in the first 30 days. And if I use that money, it would be really great to still earn a spread or uninterrupted compound interest. Are you catching on where this gets to be really advantageous and really lucrative for wealthy individuals that know how to make their money work for them? Well, they might be wealthy, but you know what? You are going to be wealthy someday too. So why not get a head start and get into this now, even though you don't have that much? That's what I did. My first policy I started way back when was $230 a month. That's right, it was very small. Now I put well into the six digits in every single year, but I had to evolve there. This developer client also had to evolve to where he's at. So the client, being a developer, his income swings, depending on projects, depending on you know, economic conditions. So when he put the 300,000 in, this was his annual premium deposit that he wanted the ability to put up. He didn't want to be locked into just that. He wanted some flexibility. So we can build a lot of flexibility into the plan, up to 90%. So in other words, if he starts with $300,000 in, in a bad year, he could have the ability to reduce that down by as much as 60 to 90%. And then when things get better, he could come back and start putting the 300 in, but he could make up whatever he didn't put in the prior couple of years, as long as he follows some simple rules. So the flexibility was another really important thing. So I'm going to squeeze flexibility in down here. So you can see these were the most important things for this particular individual for his policy, but this won't be his last policy. So I want to talk about a couple other things that were very important to him, but also will be very, very important to him in the future. So another thing that was important is remember back when I started, I talked about what this client does. He's a developer. So he's always taking loans from banks or institutions and they always want to see, well, what's behind the curtain? How much money do you got? They love having money in the bank. That's why he kept so much money in the bank. But when we showed him how he could use this for business uses, so we're just going to start over here, but we're going to specifically talk about Coley, company-owned life insurance. Now, his first policy is individually owned. So from a personal financial standpoint, this benefits from there, but also from a Coley standpoint, I want to, I want to hit that. So number one is the cash value in a whole life. And specifically, I am saying whole life. So I'm not saying IULs. I'm not saying VULs because they're not looked at the same by banks. But cash value of whole life holds a very high priority. So when you put them in order, if you were to look at a personal financial statement, and if you don't know what that is, it's basically a form we're all going to fill out at the bank that's going to list our assets, our liabilities, and then show what our net worth is. But on the asset side, what banks love, 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 love on a personal financial statement is cash in the bank. So that's always priority number one. If you got cash in the bank, the bank's happy. But you know what else banks love? And it's usually line number two on a personal financial statement, cash value life insurance. Why is that? 
Well, if you remember, I said banks are the number one purchasers of whole life in the world. They understand that the cash value is guaranteed. They understand that if that person dies, there's a death benefit paid out. They understand the pecking order and the importance of cash value. So therefore, they look at the cash value almost the same as they do cash in the bank. For somebody like this client who needs to have that, to be able to entice the banks to want to lend more and more and more money for development projects, having cash value in a whole life policy satisfies the bank's requirements from a personal financial statement. Now, not only does it satisfy from a personal financial statement, let's just say this client took money from his business account. The same idea. Didn't want to keep money in cash in the business account, wanted it actually making interest. I already told you his was five times more than what a bank was paying him. So if he just shifted the money, literally just took the money in his corporate account that's sitting in a bank account and then said, all right, here's this specially designed whole life owned by my corporation. And he put the money in there from a bank standpoint, it's the same darn thing. But now that money's earning five times more than what it was making in the bank. Now, is that making sense? So from a business or an individual standpoint, the cash value in a whole life has priority. Now, let me go into another thing as we kind of talk about this, because we could just keep going into the benefits. A couple other benefits that maybe weren't as important for this client, but I'm sure he thought about it is all of the money in cash value in a whole life policy is protected against judgments and liens in most states. So if somebody slips and falls at one of his development sites or one of his properties, this money is protected because he is in a state that is protected. Not only that, this gives him the ultimate, ultimate ability to leverage his money in two places at the same time. So when I work with some of these wealthy individuals teams, I don't always, I definitely don't wear a suit. I might not wear a ball cap, but you know, just a shirt like this. A lot of times, their attorneys, maybe their CPAs, maybe judge me a little bit right out of the hole. But I will tell you is once we get into it, I'm a nerd with this stuff. I study infinite banking concept. I study whole life. I know the ins and the outs of this. I've been doing it over 20 years now. This client's team was a phenomenal one. He had an unbelievable attorney. He's got an unbelievable tax team, not just tax professional, tax team. And he's also got people he works with on a consulting side from his trust. We haven't gotten there yet, but when I worked with his team, it was incredible. Because once they saw the reasons why we were doing this, instantly, without too much force or anything else, once we demonstrated how this works and they went through their normal questions, they loved it. They got it. They didn't sit there and try to poo-poo on it and beat it up because they didn't have anything to gain. It's not like they were trying, it's not like me fighting against a financial advisor that's trying to sell them an IUL. That's a tough game because the advisor's always trying to make a big commission. This person's team, they were on a, all on retainer. So they didn't care about selling something, they just wanted what was best for this client. So the cool part is, is when you get into this echelon, this higher level of clients, you're gonna work with their teams. And their teams are gonna be oftentimes smarter than most. And they're also gonna have more in-depth knowledge. And they understand this, they understand whole life, and they understand its uses. They may not understand what infinite banking concept is, but that's an easy thing. We just explain, put the money in, and we take the money out, and we use it to make more money. They all get that. So what I thought I would do is just show you the plan design that we came up for this developer. Here it is. As you can see, the annual premium for the policy, right here, year one, put $2.6 million in. Now I've got a couple columns, don't get too hung up on the numbers, I wanted to show it all. We've got the guaranteed column. So the guaranteed cash, he puts 2.6 million in. Guaranteed, no ifs, ands, or buts. He's got 2.349 available in the first year. But if we come over here to what we would call it the projected or the non-guaranteed cash value, you can see it's 2.395. So it's slightly more, but not a lot. Now what is the difference between guaranteed and non-guaranteed? It's one thing and it's a dividend. The only difference is this column. So the difference between the guaranteed and non-guaranteed comes down to the dividend that the insurance company pays. And they pay the dividend one time per year. The interest is calculated every single day on a compounding basis. The dividend's paid once a year at the policy anniversary date when that is declared. So here, these are the dividends the client makes. But again, puts 2.6 million in, guaranteed to have access to 2.349, and if the dividend's paid, 2.395. So you can see that's a negative use of the cash 
in the first year because you can't use all of it. The client knew this. That's what the give the takeaway is. Could not use 7.86. Oh, and by the way, if this client passed away too early, as you can see, the death benefit, $52 million. That's right, this client's relatively young in his 40s. But let's carry on. So the second year, and I actually got the amount wrong, it was $400,000. The second year, the client wanted the ability to put $400,000. I said three, but so just use it. Four hundred, dollars and the minimum on this particular plan is $275,000. So max is four, minimum two seventy-five. dollars and you can see, and there's an important thing to talk about here, in year eight, you can see how that drops. It goes from four to 275. I'll cover that in a second. But let's just go to the second year. So the first year, and I can tell you the client already did, put the 2.6 million in and took 2 million out. That was his first play. And he did it immediately in the first 30 days. That 2 million went to work for him in a, a real estate development deal. So $400,000 will be the second year's premium. So puts in 400, guaranteed to be able to use $397,000. So less than a percent of non-usable money. That's guaranteed. But if we go over here to the dividend, that year, this would be after the first year, the dividend would be $46,077, assuming current assumption and the dividends are the same as what they were the prior year. That client now puts in $400,000, will have access to $448,000. So I want you to really focus on that. Because every wealthy individual understands this, and so should you. How many of you would love the ability to put 400000 into something, and then immediately that year take out 448, put in 400, take out 448? Does that sound pretty good? Well, it should because that's a cash on cash return of 12.2%. But see, it gets better. The next year, this wealthy individual puts another 400000 in. That year has the ability to use 443,000. Now it's a little less, and there's a weird calculation that this insurance company does, but that would be 10% cash on cash. We could keep going. The fourth year puts in 400, could take out 472, then 476, then 506, then 525. Now that brings us to the seventh year. Now I want to talk a little bit about this design. To make this all work and to dump $2.6 million in, we had to buy a bunch of term insurance in this policy. So it's very important to understand that we're never gonna keep the term insurance on the policy after its usable period is, is done. We don't need it after the seventh year because of the max seven payroll. We have to have term insurance, the death benefit needed to be at a certain level based on IRS rules for seven years. So in the eighth year, right here, we're gonna drop the term insurance. We're literally gonna drop $29 million or, or yeah, $29 million in death benefit. Now that's not a good thing for some people. He could keep that term on, but that's not the way we design them. We want efficiency. We want the maximum cash value. So what we do is we drop the term. So now his death benefit goes down to 25 million, but it will continue to climb as time goes by. But now I want you to look at something. The eighth year, the most this client can put in is 275. That 275 grows that year by 483,000. Now, you didn't hear that wrong. Eight years in, all this money's been compounding uninterrupted. I already told you that. So even though if every year he took this money out, that money's still compounding. Yes, he's got to pay the insurance company an interest rate, but it's still making a spread. Puts in 275, the eighth year. Has the ability to take out 483,000. I want you to tell me any wealthy person that would not understand that. Heck, I want to tell you, I want you to tell me any one person that doesn't understand that. The math is quite simple. This is an illustration right from the company, which is why we've got all these cool little disclosures down here, explaining cash on cash return, explaining information about the non-guaranteed values. The non-guaranteed values are non-guaranteed because the dividend is not guaranteed, but the guaranteed is, and that guaranteed interest rate will be paid for the rest of this client's life. If anything ever happens, they have a death benefit paid to his family, and he has access and use and liquidity of this money the entire time. So now I know that this might not be applicable for you. So what I did is I actually came up with another design that I'd like to show you here real quick, because I knew that you know maybe this one wouldn't work for you, all right? So I, I came up with a different design that let's talk about real quick. Now this client's wealthy as well, 
But this client did not want to put as much money into the policy. Had a little bit less money. So they had a, they had a sale of a real estate property, an investment property that they sold, which gave them a couple hundred thousand dollars. So what this client wanted to do is put 200,000 in up front. This is a different company, just so you know. So I'm showing two different companies so you can understand it's not the company, it's the design. Because that last company was a giant mutually owned insurance company, just like this one is, but they're two separate companies. This client here puts 200,000 in the first year, guaranteed to have access to 179, but with dividend has $187,000. Now that's 90 plus percent of the money that he put in the first year, as you can see, only gives up access to 6.48%. But let's go to the second year. This client had a lot less that they wanted to put in each year, 30,000, but they were equally concerned about flexibility, even more so than the other one. 30,000, they have a minimum of 10,000. Okay, so at any time during the first 10 years, they can put in 30 or drop it down to 10, five. They'd have to make an extra P way deposit of about 120 a year to keep that option, but they can do that. So the second year they put 30,000 in, they're guaranteed to have 24 of that. But if we add the dividend, that means they're going to have 33,000. So if you come over here, I'm just showing the cash value and then I'm showing you the projected cash value per year. They put in 30. The second year they have 33,380 to take out. That's 11.27. Then it goes to 17, then 23, then 31. That is cash on cash return. They put in 30 the third year. They have 35, then 37, then 39, then 41. You get the drift. Down here, the 10th year. This one, the last one we dropped the term in the eighth year. This one we're going to keep it on for 10 years because they want the ability to max fund. So this one, you can see we dropped the term insurance here, which also drops the death benefit down. Let me actually minimize just a tiny little bit here. So the death benefit on this one goes from 3.7 million to 1.1 million. That's because we're dropping the term. But look what happens. Because we get rid of those added costs, that term insurance cost, puts in 10,500, has the ability to take out 34,293. Are you getting that? Remember the last one was just as good, but this is smaller. 10,500 goes in the 11th year. Because we got rid of all those costs, 34,000 is the amount that this person will have after dividend. That is a 226.6% cash on cash return. So I could show you policy design after policy design. I could show you how we build these to do this. And I'll tell you the one thing that you need to do, and we'll put another video up in a second. The one thing you have to do to be able to design policies the way we do so that our clients have access to cash is we have to design it so that we make a heck of a lot less money. So the average brother-in-law that would sell you a regular whole life, remember the one that has no money in year one, no money in year two, barely any money in year three, if any, that advisor or that brother-in-law made a bunch of money in commissions. That's what Dave Ramsey always talks about. Oh, they're overpriced. The only one making money is the agent getting it in commission, right? So to design this policy right here, we're taking roughly between a 60 to 90% cut in our commission. I'd have to do the math, but this is about a 90% cut in commission. And that first one for the developer was actually definitely an 89% cut in commission. So we make 60 to 90% less money than your brother-in-law does. We're both doing whole life, okay? Some would say, you know, both of us are doing the same thing, but we're designing it so that you have liquidity access to your capital, better growth, because we're stripping out all the cost. We're stripping out all that cost of insurance that comes with the big old death benefit, and we're focusing on you building your own banking system. And then from there, the other part that we teach, and you can watch all my videos on YouTube, so right now, if you like this, right at the bottom, why don't you click that subscribe button? It's right here. Yep, pretty colors. Click that and subscribe. And then also right up here at the little bell, looking into the light, smash that bell so you're notified every time we put another video up. If you're just seeing this for the first time, great, welcome. But there's a whole lot more because all I talked about today was just the policy. You see, the infinite banking concept is the process on how we actually use the policy, and that's a whole nother topic, but we're not gonna get into that today. So folks, this is why the wealthy use whole life, and this is why you should use it as well. 
our team would be more than happy to design a policy like this for you. We would be more than happy to work with your team. We can educate your team, we can show them all the things, and we can help design your financial situation to be exactly what you want using non-traditional asset classes like this. So if you want to do that, the first thing I need you to do is I need you to watch a video. So right here is another video I want you to watch, teaching you all about the infinite banking concept. Because the policy is just one thing, but the process is the next thing. So watch this video on how you can be your own bank, which will teach you the infinite banking concept. I hope you enjoyed today. This is What Now, What's Next? And you know what? I kind of know what's next for you. We're going to be talking, aren't we? Yeah, I know. Pretty exciting stuff. So book a call after you watch the video with us. We'll put the link right down in the bottom, and we'll see you next time.